nice to eat and listen at the same time. And uh, we have two representatives from the session uh, this afternoon who are going to prevent, present uh, each about 15 minutes of overview. Uh, the sessions this afternoon are called, the first one is Human Evolution, Where Have We Been and Where Are We Going? And the second one is called Human Biology, The Great Deal We Don't Know and How to Discover It. Uh, I read a textbook of cell biology every five years, and unfortunately textbooks tend to give students the idea that we know about 95% of what we need to know, because we don't talk enough about what we don't know. But in fact, uh, we're here to assure, especially the students, that uh, there's a huge amount yet to learn. Uh, I like to say we probably know 5% of what we need to know, uh, not 95%. And these two panels will, first of all, talk about the amazing amount we've learned uh, in the last 30 years or so. but also emphasize uh, where we're going and what we need to know. So uh, Craig Mello uh, is going to start. And I should say you have in the program the bios of all the speakers, so I don't need to waste time going through them. Craig? <laughs> Craig. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Now. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk today about the genomics revolution, and it really is uh, a truly exciting revolution in science that's going on right now. In fact, it is so incredible that I have to use a soundtrack for my first slide. And it's actually going to be uh, some words in English uh, coming across the screen that send a little bit of message that go along with uh, these <coughs> children of tomorrow that you'll see developing in the background. I'm going to have to ask uh, for the lights to be dimmed a little, I think, uh, for this in order for you to be able to see the slides. But here it goes. It's going to speak for itself. Take me to the magic of the moment on a glory night where the children of tomorrow Okay, so those are the children of tomorrow, little uh, embryos developing, and, and as you were watching them, uh, what you saw in green was a jellyfish protein that they're expressing at all of the tight junctions of their hypodermal cells, so you can actually watch the developmental program unfold inside of these embryos, a process that goes on in the soil all over this world and a process that has been going on unbroken through time for billions of years. Because as that slide said, the, um, every organism alive today, including you and me, are related to, to each other. Uh, those worms are related to an ancestral organism that shared its ancestry with humans. Uh, and of course, uh, you're, the second speaker today is going to talk about human evolution uh, a little bit more. Uh, specifically, but when you think about human evolution, you're often thinking about uh, chimpanzees and maybe Neanderthals and then humans. In fact, I'm, my task is to give you a little bit of a, an overview of the other 99.9% of evolution, and so I'm going to do that in a few slides just to make you 
keep in mind that we are very close related to worms. And indeed, as Nietzsche said, much of what is in you is still worm. So the two themes that uh, Bruce mentioned a moment ago, where have we been and where are we going? Um, and then the great deal we don't know and how to discover it. And here uh, in this first slide is a, a beautiful picture of a Cielagon's uh, ovary producing embryos. And you can see on the top several of these nuclei with their little uh, orange uh, spheres surrounding them. Those are germ granules. Inside the dark circles, that's where the DNA is. That's the genome. And in these little circles around the outside, there are proteins and RNA that play a very important role in programming the genome. They're epigenetic uh, factors that I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, in, in a brief uh, discussion towards the end of the talk. But the important thing to remember is that all life is very closely related uh, to each other on this planet. And indeed, an ancestral, I think it's in Bruce's book, I read somewhere, a very nice quote. I don't know where it comes from. But at some point in the history, our own germ lineage resided uh, in, a, in an ovary very much like this, together with these uh, ancestors of the, of the nematode C. elegans. And here's the real Nobel Prize winner, the worm C. elegans, uh, along with many other model systems, whether it be bacterial cells, yeast, flies, uh, many important uh, discoveries with relevance to medicine and direct rev relevance to uh, human development have come from studying model systems. And why is that? Okay, well, I often find myself having to justify, you know, why would anyone work on a worm at a medical school? Uh, you know, you would think, you know, you'd work on cancer or liver disease or something uh, more directly applicable. But in fact, as I said, we're very closely related to these organisms. And I think we don't really appreciate how incredibly closely related we are. So I want to just show you this slide, which indicates on this side, a picture uh, that was on the cover of Nature uh, several years ago showing a snowball Earth event. This is an event that has occurred several times in the history of, of the planet. And um, the most recent of these events, which is a worldwide glaciation event, occurred just, just a little uh, before what was Darwin remarked on as the Cambrian explosion. This explosion of multicellular life that was larger and for the first time left a plethora of hard body parts uh, that became fossilized. And the point is that, and this is one of the amazing things that the molecular biology revolution has helped us to understand and appreciate, the organisms that lived below that glaciation event were already incredibly sophisticated organisms. Like C. elegans and humans, they had muscles, they had nervous systems, they had eyes, they had sensory organisms of a whole variety of kinds. Um, and they also had the inner workings, the molecular mechanisms that we know of today. The genetic code is, is incredibly ancient, uh, for example. You heard about the DNA. Um, but I think this was certainly not a given. At the beginning of the molecular, the, uh, molecular revolution, when Watson and Crick first uh, uh, described the structure of DNA, there was no guarantee that everything today would have the same genetic code, but they do. So the ancestors of worms and humans uh, are back here probably over a billion years ago. Uh, there was another fauna that flourished on the planet called the Ediacaran fauna. That was, uh, went through an extinction, coincident with another major glaciation. Uh, and then um, finally, we had the Cambrian explosion. The Earth warmed. Environments became uh, amenable to life of larger size. Oxygen evolved into the atmosphere. And so we had uh, this flourishing of life. So much of what we think of as progress and evolution is really the adaptation of these really incredibly sophisticated 
highly evolved creatures that had already survived for more than uh, three quarters of the history of life uh, prior to the Cambrian. Okay, and I'm going to mention something today, just a little bit, about this thing called RNAi, which I work on, which is a genetic mechanism that exists in plants and animals and fungi and even some bacteria that allows the organism to control genetic information even after it's left the nucleus. But the, the thing that I want to bring out here, just briefly, is the point that life is ancient on this planet. And indeed, if the environment were to continue to be supportive to life, life is immortal. This is, this is truly amazing. And one of the motivations for me as a scientist when I was a young kid was this idea that life can span these incredible periods of time. And I, I don't think we can really appreciate this. Uh, when I was here with Andrew Fire in 2006, we shared the prize uh, the, the stage with George um, Smoot and John Mather, whose uh, work helped to map the cosmic background radiation and, and date the age of the universe at about 13.7 billion years. And the thing that we uh, remarked together about was that life exists on that cosmic time scale. Life on this planet arose 3.8 billion years ago. That's older than many stars ever get to be. And it's actually close to a quarter of the age of the universe. More than, more than a quarter. And if you look, if you look at, at uh, the, night the night sky, sky this, is a, this is a picture from the Hubble uh, telescope. Tell 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 I just want to show, show you. Here's the Big Dipper. And there's, there's a little slice light 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 you can see in the corner there. there. And that's, and that's my little mirror here. here. And then, and then and a little square from, from that from that one up again here. here. And the amazing the thing that they will show us is that anywhere you point your telescope in that sky, you point it away from, from stars that are in our own galaxy, galaxy, and you look, you, look, you take a long exposure, exposure, you see a field of view like this, and those are not stars. Every one of those is a galaxy with an average number of stars of 200 billion. So the universe, as ancient as, as it is, is also incredibly vast. And in every direction that we look, there are more and more galaxies. Um, undoubtedly, the universe is teeming with life. And I think it's just important uh, for all of us, you know, thinking about where we've come from, we, we've all come uh, from this amazingly mysterious uh, universe that we inhabit. And that's one of the beauties of science, uh, that it brings us into a more mysterious world, not a less mysterious world. Now. Briefly, I don't have time to give a, a seminar about uh, my work, but I want to just tell you something that we're very excited about, mainly because I think one of the questions in, to me that's very important, and, and I think very motivational, uh, is what, what do we not know, and, and how do we discover it, really? One of the themes here. And, and in order to learn something, when you don't even have a hypothesis yet, you really have to uh, step back and let the organism tell you what is important. And in order to do that kind of experimental work, you need to use model organisms. Model organisms play a very important role in the kind of genomics and genetics that Eric Lander talked about today, although he didn't really mention it, they're sort of the glue that pulls it all together for us. Because you identify a disease gene in the human, now you have to try to understand how that disease gene functions in the cell. And in order to study that in the human would take lifetimes, decades. And we don't have that kind of time. So instead, we turn to a model animal, for example, like C. elegans, where you can model many of the cellular pathways that are important in cancer and, and a whole variety of other pathways. So one of the things my lab has been fundamentally interested in is how do cells process information. And um, I'm going to talk in my uh, few last few minutes here about this question, can cells remember? Is there an, is there, and they clearly do, but in this case I mean can they actually experience something new and then take that acquired information and pass it on to their progeny? And in fact they can, we call that epigenetics, um, and what I'm showing you in this picture are 
three different pictures of proteins we call argonauts, which are, I'll show you in a moment, uh, factors involved in epigenetics. And you can see that they form uh, these red uh, or green uh, speckles around the nucleus. The DNA is stained in blue, and you're looking at many nuclei in that ovary of the worm, and you're seeing these granular structures on the uh, periphery of the germ cells. Similar structures also exist in the human uh, and, in fact, in all animals. Now, before I, I, I this movie is just going to show you everything you need to know about molecular biology and the cell in one minute. This is the DNA. We're flying along here in a spaceship. And you can see the DNA now opening up to be replicated. Actually, this is to be transcribed into RNA. And this is the RNA polymerase, the big green blob here. This is not an actual cell. In fact, if it was an actual cell, say a little bit more on this in a moment, these events would be occurring uh, much, much faster. This is splicing. The RNA is being now uh, polyadenylated and it transported out into the cytoplasm. Once it's out in the cytoplasm, it's going to be uh, translated by this amazing machine called the ribosome. The ribosome there is tracking along, reading the triplet code, incorporating amino acids. And in a moment, you're going to see a scientist injecting double-stranded RNA. That should have been helical, but they made a mistake there. That's Dicer. OK, dicing it up into little pieces. Now, the one strand is taken away, and the other strand carries information. The scientist is now using the cell's search engine to find target sequences and to regulate them. And that's the RNA interference mechanism that I'm just going to say a couple more words on. But the key thing here is that the cell has a way of regulating information after it leaves the nucleus. And why is that? Okay, The cell is completely full of information. Cells entered the information age 3.8 billion years ago. Okay, Lucky us. We, that is us biologists, we entered the information age just in time for the genome revolution. Because without the technology to process information ourselves, we would be helpless. We wouldn't be able to, the genome sequence would be completely useless without some way of analyzing it rapidly. Now, inside the cell, believe it or not, that little green thing, that that uh, transcribes RNA at a rate of 50, over 50 residues per second per second, and almost flawlessly. The ribosome translates that genetic code at three codons, or, or three nucleotides per codon, at the rate of 20 codons per second. Imagine the information flowing in that cell. And once that RNA is out in the cytoplasm, it's being translated that fast, making protein that is telling the cell, do this, do this, do this. The cell's on a track, right? It needs a way to change track, to change directions quickly. It can't wait for the gene to turn off and the RNA to degrade. It's got to have a way of controlling that information once it's out there. And so cells invented these argonaut proteins. And I'm going to, we discovered RDE1, which is the first of these argonaut proteins involved in the mechanism you were just watching. It's a cellular search engine. But one of the great things about genomics is when you clone a worm gene like RD1, which we cloned in a genetic screen for mutants that knock out an RNA interference response, you find all the homologs of that gene in the genome, including over here four human genes, these H, S, AGO 1 through 4 and four more human genes over here. And what you see right away is that RDE1 is actually less similar to the human genes here than two other genes in the worm. And in fact, the worm has not just one of these argonaut proteins. It has over 20 of them. And the human has eight. There's four over there, and there's four over there. There's two worm genes over here on this side. 
in the circle, you can see one of them that are related to those four that are involved in the germline in the human and the mouse where they've been studied. Uh, and of course, I'm not going to have time to go into all this, but the point is genomics empowers model systems in a way that is you know, really transformational because when you identify a gene in a model system, you can now instantly find the gene in the human genome and you can begin to learn about how the human works. So we discovered an RNA interference mechanism, a mechanism in the worm. Immediately thereafter, we were able, other researchers would be able to, uh, to begin translating that into uh, applications in the human. And indeed, what they found, I, I've been told Google uh, is streaming this right now, so I'm not just putting this up as a plug for Google, but this enzyme is in fact the search engine of the cell. It allows the cell to take a short piece of genetic code and to use that information to rapidly search for and control related information throughout the cell. Importantly, in 2001 or 2002, shortly after the genome sequence was uh, com almost complete, we, again speaking for the field, began to use or understand how to use the RNAi method to introduce our own search queries into the human Google, if you will. So in culture, it's actually very straightforward now to order by Federal Express a sequence that will turn off any human gene and it will be here tomorrow and it's guaranteed to turn your gene off or your money back. Okay, not your gene, but the gene in your cell in the laboratory. Um, and in fact, you, this really has become a, a very important tool for research because now we can very rapidly profile genes that are expressed or perhaps misexpressed in a disease state and we can inactivate those genes very easily, very rapidly in the laboratory and begin to discover their functions. And what this enzyme does is it holds a short piece of RNA here in red. That's the guide strand. It uses that genetic information to make base pairs with target sequences. And uh, then it wraps, the red strand wraps around the target and there's a catalytic center pushing the target blue strand up into this catalytic center, allowing that protein to cleave the target and stopping the activity of that, that RNA even after it's been expressed. So cells entered the information age billions of years ago. They've been regulating their information in this kind of way for a very long time, and they're very, very sophisticated. They're on operating system like three billion at this point, literally. It's really exciting. So uh, I, I really don't have time to go into it, but you know, I'm talking about the most highly evolved organism here on the planet, the nematode worm C. elegans. Okay, this this little animal can make 300 progeny in three days and it doesn't even have to find a mate. It's basically an uh, incredible, incredible animal. And it can, what we've discovered recently is that it is using Argonaut systems to remember what genes it expressed in the last generation. And what you see again, this is just the same picture, but indeed uh, these three different Argonauts represent, these are the, the search engines, represent different mechanisms in the cell. One is a memory of non-self, the Wago pathway. Those, that is a memory of which genes to keep off next generation. Caesar one, we believe, we're about to test this, I hope, is a memory of self. It remembers which genes to turn on and allow to be expressed each generation. And the PRG1 Argonaut family, the Peewee Argonaut, is a search engine that finds things that have not been seen before. And I'm just going to show you the model that we're working on now uh, where genomically encoded short RNAs called peewee RNAs are loaded onto this Argonaut called peewee. It can search not for, for, not, not for viruses or for some weird structure associated with viral RNA, but it can actually look for sequences that have not been seen before. And the way it does that is by communicating with these two different memory systems. 
if it has been seen before, the seizure system prevents the scanning factor from initiating the silencing pathway. And then once the silencing pathway is initiated, it's maintained permanently. And this is not soft epigenetics. This is hard epigenetics. This is permanent silencing of a gene. And it's really, I, I'm going to just skip ahead because I don't want to take up too much time. But we actually gave this a new, a new name, RNA-induced epigenetics, because uh, the way it works is a gene uh, can enter one of two states when it's introduced into the cell. So we call this putting a transgene in. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have a transgene that's turned off. And on the right-hand side, you have a new transgene that's turned on. And the interesting thing is that they interact with each other. So the silent allele can actually send an RNA signal that turns off the active allele, inducing an epigenetic silent state that is maintained uh, permanently in the animal. Interestingly, there's also an activating signal. The active allele can transmit an activating signal after enough, and, and this again is still not proven, but we believe that this licensing state becomes uh, fully licensed over time. Once a gene is fully licensed for expression in the animal, it can transactivate a silent allele. So initially, silencing is dominant. You get dominant silencing. Eventually, activation is dominant. And I, I bring all of this up only because you know, this is a worm, and surely humans can't work this way. You know, this, is, this is really sophisticated stuff. Um, maybe maybe um, worms are special. Uh, they've said that before about worms. Um, and uh, I think they are special, actually. But that doesn't mean humans aren't special, too. Um, and I'll end here uh, by talking just a moment about the future, uh, where we're going. Uh, this is my daughter, Vicki, uh, back in 2006. She's here tonight, uh, or today. Um, and um, you can see her at the Nobel Prize headquarter where um, you know, there's gold medals everywhere. You know, it's amazing. It's just down the street. If you ever get a chance, you should go there. Uh, and of course, when we went in, I said, Vicki, grab as many of those as you can. So you can see her picking them up and st sticking them in her shirt and stuff. Um, and the reason these gold medals are really special, of course, is that they're filled with chocolate. And uh, the reason this slide is very poignant is that ever since Vicky was about one and a half, she's had type 1 diabetes. So for her to eat that chocolate, she has to give herself insulin. The insulin that she takes is made for her by bacteria that read the human genetic code and make human insulin for her and for millions of other people like her. Without it, she would die. And that is the kind of medicine, that is the kind of transformational medicine that we uh, collectively, as a scientific community, are daily on the verge of discovering. The Genome Project has accelerated those opportunities. Unfortunately, funding is not keeping up. We need our people, you folks, to vote, to get your governments uh, to spend more, because there are tremendous, tremendous opportunities to change and to save lives of people like Vicky, who now suffer from many diseases. As Eric Lander pointed out, we now know the genetic underlying cause of many diseases. But getting a, a treatment can take years. We need to step up the funding, not uh, flat fund science, as we have been doing in the United States. I hope not in Sweden. And I'll stop there. And I don't know if we have time for questions, Bruce. No. OK. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll change gear a little bit to more recent evolution. And perhaps I should start out by saying that I think that one of the very many um, unexpected, I think, consequences of the elucidation of the DNA structure that was honored here 50 years ago is the extent to which the study of genomes, of DNA sequences from organisms, 
have illuminated evolutionary history in general and what I will dwell on then human history in particular. And in hindsight, that may not be that surprising, perhaps. Given the fact the slides are actually bigger than the screen, they're sort of cut off here, but uh, given the fact that our genome is 3.2 billion nucleotides or letters big, and each of us, of course, carry two genomes, one from our moms and one from our dads, and the number of differences between these two genomes is in the order of 3 million or so. And these differences between a genome and me and one of you go back to mutations that happen in our ancestors. So by looking at the patterns with which we share these mutations, we can find out things about what happened in the past. And one of the most fundamental things, I think, that have come out when one study this variation in humans is that most of our genetic variation exists in Africa. So if we take the variation in Africa and compare it to the variation outside Africa, although there is probably seven or eight times more people living outside Africa, the amount of genetic variation there is less. And all those variants that we find outside Africa, most of them we find related variants inside Africa, but in addition, we find a component of the variation in Africa that's not outside. And the interpretation that has come out of that is that the origin of our direct ancestors, of fully modern humans that are essentially as us, is in Africa, and that some of that variation went out, so to say, to colonize the rest of the world. And we've been also able to get an approximately date on that by looking at, for example, the extent to which these mutations are associated with each other along a chromosome. And one has found out that that date is quite recent. So in the order of, say, 100,000 years ago, people start coming out of Africa, and more seriously, about 50,000 years ago. So what I then often like to say that from a genomic perspective, we're really an African species. We're a species that emerged in Africa quite recently, and either we still live in Africa, or we live in rather recent exile outside Africa. But there is, of course, a complication of this model. Uh, and that is that when modern humans appeared, 100,000 years ago or so, they were not alone on the planet. There were other forms of humans around, both inside Africa and outside Africa. For example, in Europe, although you don't really see us on the slide, there were well-known Neanderthals. And further to the east, there were, were other forms. And a big, big debate since 30 years or so in paleontology is what happened when modern humans met these forms did one mix or not, for example? And such questions we can now also address with genomic means. So my laboratory works since almost 30 years now on methods to retrieve DNA from old bones like this that are 30, 40, 50,000 years old. We've done this from sites such as these in Croatia where you find Neanderthals. You can now drill a little hole in a bone, take out some bone powder, and retrieve DNA from it, and study the entire genome. And what has come out of that over the past two years is the insight that indeed, when modern humans came out of Africa, and very early humans, that became the ancestors actually of everybody outside Africa, they somewhere, perhaps in the Middle East, met Neanderthals, mixed with them, and then carried a bit of Neanderthal DNA with them to other parts of the world, to the extent that in the order of 2 to 3 percent of the genome of people outside Africa come from Neanderthals. We've also gone on to study other extinct forms of humans further to the east, particularly in a place called the Nisava Cave, where in 2008, Russian archaeologists found a tiny little piece of a finger bone from the last digit of a pinky. And our techniques are now so efficient in retrieving DNA from such remains that from this little piece of bone, we've been able to determine a DNA 
sequence that is as accurate of the whole genome as uh, we would do from a blood sample from one of you today. And we have then been able to show that this little pinky comes from a group of humans that we call Denisovans, that are related to ne Neanderthals, but have a long independent history. <coughs> we have also been able to show that they have contributed to people today, but not in Siberia up there, where they one found this bone, but in Melanesia, so in Papua New Guinea, in Australia, in Fiji, and so on. So the sort of model that we're to explain this is that when modern humans come to Southeast Asia, they carry with them the Neanderthal component, they meet the Nisivans somewhere, mix with them, and go on out into the Melanesia, carrying with them now, in addition, the Denisova component, to the extent then that there is 5% of the Nisivan DNA, for example, in people in Papua New Guinea. So sort of our view that has come out of this then, of what happened when modern humans appear in Africa, we don't know quite where, but then emerge out of Africa is that they meet Neanderthals and at least once, maybe two times at least, mixed with Neanderthals, continue to spread over the world. Somewhere in Southeast Asia, they will meet the Nisivans, mix with them and continue out to, uh, to Melanesia. Then with time, these other forms of humans become extinct, probably in some form related to the appearance of modern humans, their extinction. But they live on a little bit today than in that 2, 3, 4, 5 percent of the genomes of people today come from these extinct forms. And you can see the consequences of that if you then study a genomic variation today. And unfortunately, the important part of this slide is sort of cut off. But this is a picture of chromosome 21 in Europeans, in many hundred Europeans. And below here, it was compared to the Neanderthal genome. And you would have been able to see that there are 3-4% of Europeans that look almost identical to Neanderthals for a segment here. So there are sort of chunks of DNA that we can find in 2-3% of people in this room that are almost identical to Neanderthals. And what then becomes very interesting is, of course, to ask the question, well, what does that mean? Does that mean anything for our phenotype, as we would say today? That is, how we look, how we behave, how our bodies function. Do these chunks of genes that come from Neanderthals have any consequences. And there we hit really the limit of our knowledge today. There is some indications that some genes involved in the immune response have come over from Neanderthals and Denisovans to us. But we don't know if some variants that came over has any influence on disease susceptibility or on other features in ourselves. And I want to come back to this difficulty in answering questions like this at the very end. But before that, I just want to mention that there is another aspect of this work that I find really interesting. And that is that here we have the human genome in a complete form, not just a part like that. We can compare it to the great apes. But now we then have the genome of our very closest relative the Neanderthals. So we're not anymore comparing our lineage back five to seven million years to a common ancestor with the chimps, but we can look over the last half million years, or so perhaps 400,000 years in human history, and look on everything that happened in our last segment of our history. And why is that particularly interesting? Well, I think it's interesting because it happened a lot of things in human history in this last part. That has a big consequence for our history, of course. But it's not only self-interest, because much of what happened to us have now consequences for large parts of the biosphere, actually. With modern humans, technologies start changing rapidly, for example. Neanderthals lived for, for three, four hundred thousand years and made pretty much the same stone tools at the beginning of their history as towards the end of their history. With modern humans, this totally changes, and our technology today is, of course, totally different from just a few thousand years ago. Another aspect is art, at least art that we immediately recognize as art, comes only with fully modern humans. 
And another aspect is that we start spreading. These earlier forms of humans lived in Africa, Asia, Europe for almost two million years. They never spread over oceans. And in just 50,000 years, we have spread to every habitable part of the globe. And as I said, we influence large parts of the biosphere today, as we know. So the reason, sort of, or the biological background for this, presumably resides in something that changed in our biology in this last little piece of our history. So these were, are then mutations that happened on the way to humans that are fixed in everybody today. No matter where we live on the planet, we share these changes. But the Neanderthals look like the apes and the monkeys. And since a few months now, since we have this high quality genome of a Denisovan, the relative of Neanderthal, and also now actually of a Neanderthal, we can make this catalog of all these changes. And the fascinating thing uh, is, if you could see it, that is not a very long list. It's around 100,000 changes in our genome that are present in everybody as far as we know today and are so recent that they happen after the Neanderthals. And around 10,000 gains and losses on nucleotides in the genome. So that's not a very, very long list. So the fascinating question I now think is how can we say what they, which of these 100,000 changes are of importance for how we look, how we behave, how we think, for our cultural development? And here we now sort of come up towards the limits of our abilities, of our knowledge and capabilities today. One way to sort of predict what such a change would cause is what Eric discussed in his talk, is to look a gene that is affected by such a change. What diseases do we know that affect that gene? The other mutations in the gene, what diseases do they call, cause? And this is now hard to follow here, but we have a list of 35 of these genes that are affected by such things. We know monogenic diseases that affect them. Four of these 35 genes affect the skin. That's perhaps not so surprising that something in how our skin looks or functions has changed recently in human history. More surprising is that six of these genes actually affect the eye. So it's sort of as a surprise, to me at least, something in vision may have changed recently in human history. But what it is, we have no clue, of course. So another way of going after this is to look for what is conserved, what is the same in all monkeys, in all apes, and in Neanderthals, yet have changed in humans very recently and spread so that we all carry it. So if we look at that way on these genes, and now just focusing on genes that encode proteins that we understand the best, we have 23 genes with such changes. And it's rather interesting to note that two of them affect axonal and dendritic growth, so how nerve cells establish contacts with each other in the brain. Two other ones affect synaptic transmission, how this axons and dendrites send signals to each other in the brain, and two others of them are kind of carry risk alleles for autism, another a disease where at least to some extent is due to problems with communication of nerve cells. But there is a bit but on which I want to end. This is interesting, it hints on what systems might be affected, but we have no clue what these changes really cause. So sort of dream for the next decade, I think, is to be able to, with some chance of being correct, many, most of the times, come from a genomic change to predicting what that has for consequences in a phenotype. As you heard in Eric to Eric's talk, most of this knowledge now comes from going from the phenotype back to the genome by looking for association in the population between diseases and the genome or linkage in families between diseases and the genome. But the big, big hope, the dream is then in the future to be able to go directly from the genome and understand something of the phenotype by looking at it in these types of changes or in the genome you sequence in a patient. So how would we ever come to that? I think 
there's huge questions the big data as a buzzword now that we need to be collected. We need to know in the end of the day how each gene is regulated in each cell type in our bodies. And then we need to know how the gene products of these genes work together in systems, if you like, in each cell type. And we need in the end then to know the function of each single nucleotide in our genome in each cell type so that we, in a, in a way, actually, in the end, understand how the genome can produce a human being. And that's, of course, a very, very tall order, a long-term goal, so to say. But perhaps then, after lunch, in this discussion, discussion session, we can discuss how we could take the first steps in that direction. And with that, then, I thank you for your attention. Well, we get to go uh, over to the next uh, hall, across the street again. See you there. <laughs>